Welcome everyone. Today we're going to try something slightly different. I'm doing a post commentary on my recent Roman Empire IGT speedrun this time. This allows me to talk about the reasons behind certain actions and strategies a bit more in detail, so that maybe you can learn something along the way or find some new ways to improve on my final time. I was rather obsessed with realizing Roman ambitions as early as possible, measured by the in-game date and think the results are also interesting to people outside the Hoi4 speedrunning community. The run was done on the current version and on Iron Man with all DLCs enabled. I tried to explain everything on the fly, but I will address some things like the overarching key strategies whenever there's time in between input heavy segments. Enjoy! Let's select Italy in the 1936 scenario and begin with our setup. We start with going for electronic mechanical engineering and paratroopers to have them at our disposal as quickly as possible. Construction really doesn't matter this time. Production wise we focus on transport planes and infantry equipment. I put in the convoys just to get rid of the dockyard notifications. We now select all of our air wings and bring them over to Ethiopia. This will temporarily clog up the airport but we'll take care of that in a moment. To later have an easier time managing them, we send all ships to Sicily and all of our divisions to a fallback order in Genoa. Don't forget to trade for some oil and rubber for plane and fuel production. Our divisions in Ethiopia are sufficient to end the ongoing war there quickly, so we just assign a general and field marshal, prepare the front lines and do some manual pathing. If we rely on the AI to win this, things will take way too long. Our goal is to end this conflict around early to mid-February and grind at least 15 army experience for template changes later on. While our army is on the offensive, we wait for 25 political power. Once we have enough, we justify on Albania. Our battleships have the longest range with 3000 kilometers, which is why we split them from the main fleet and sent them to Somaliland for naval invasion support later down the line. Since all planes have long arrived at the airport, we sent the naval bombers back to Italy and split up the fighters into two wings, of which we are sending one off to an adjacent airport. If you ever wonder why I'm doing things that seem a bit odd, like taking the naval bombers with me to Ethiopia despite not needing them, Please know that I've been grinding this strategy hard and needed to keep the input down to not become insane over the many restarts. Ethiopia is about to fall and we have more army experience than we need. We could finish the war a bit quicker, but it would not change the timeline of the campaign. With the end of January approaching, our two unused research slots are about to reach the maximum buffer of 30 days. As soon as that's the case, we replace electronic mechanical engineering and paratroopers with a different research and put them into the pre-buffered research slots. This saves just enough time to finish the research before our first war, which will kick off on the 18th of May. And the war with Ethiopia is over. Now it's important that we do not puppet or annex them. Instead we just hit done. This allows us to skip the focus triumph in Africa, which is necessary to quickly get uh, a claim on Yugoslavia and a war goal on Greece later. Usually you don't want to bypass um, the focus and instead get the bonuses on stability and war support. To avoid reassignment penalties I already swapped out the armies for our general but that's just a habit and not actually necessary. After sending our Italian boys home we join the Axis which is possible now that we are no longer at war and apply some changes to our division templates. We first need a two-width placeholder division and cavalry is perfect for that. Our fighting divisions will use the former colonial template but get reduced to 10 width and no support. Since I plan on using them in the immediate future, I'll leave out the tank and cavalry divisions here and change all others to the 10 width template. 
Now we select 10 of our divisions to plan the naval invasions. 10 is the maximum limit we can use for naval invasions without additional research, but we will work around that limit soon. With access to German territory, we plan two naval invasions all along the eastern coastline of the United Kingdom and another one into South Africa. The game notifies us that we have empty orders, but that doesn't stop the game from planning the orders anyway, allowing us to make use of it on the fly later. Let's not forget to send the divisions over and recruit plenty of the placeholder divisions that we previously made. The equipment that we got from changing most divisions to the 10 width template is enough so that we can recruit an army and a half worth of placeholder divisions. And for good measure, we throw in some additional infantry divisions as well. After our units left Ethiopian territory, we can swap their templates too to gain some more infantry equipment. We're going to have a lot of borders to cover in the future, so we need as many divisions as possible early on. One of the divisions will stay behind for the naval invasions of South Africa. The divisions will come under attack before being able to leave the port, which is why we cannot use the placeholder, placeholder template here. The division would simply die before being able to depart for South Africa. While we wait for our fresh recruits to get out of basic training, let me address research and some other stuff real quick. Since it doesn't really matter for this campaign, I won't comment on the selection of research from here on out, because it has no impact on the run. If you plan to continue to play after forming the Roman Empire, I highly advise to not repeat every shortcut that I take, since it sometimes sacrifices a lot just to shorten the campaign by a couple of days, or to minimize the inputs. This is especially true for how I handle the navy, as you'll see soon enough, unfortunately. After reaching the minimum training limit of 20%, we deploy our placeholder and infantry divisions and sort them into armies. 24 of those placeholder divisions, as well as 9 of the infantry units, will move to Germany. The leftover infantry will have to hold the borders. We then spread the remaining placeholder divisions across the Mediterranean in anticipation of the upcoming war against the Allies and move our navy to northern Germany as well to support our naval invasions of the United Kingdom. Most of the setup is now done. The war is still two months ahead of us, so while we wait let me explain why we are justifying on Albania. I already stated the most important reason earlier, it is the fastest way for Italy to start a war. Ethiopia aside, and since this is an IGT run and in-game time is our primary scale by which we measure success, getting into a war fast is an absolute must. But just fighting Albania won't get us anywhere of course. It's a tiny conflict as long as there are no major nations involved, which is why we're going to justify on the United States. We have absolutely no intention of letting the war goal finish, but it allows us to artificially spike world tension way beyond the 25% threshold at which the leader of the Allies starts spamming guarantees. Naturally, the UK will therefore give out uh, a guarantee to Albania, allowing us to escalate the conflict. As you probably have guessed already, we are going to change some of the placeholder divisions into paratroopers. By using placeholder divisions, we can move the units into position long before the research for paratroopers is actually finished. Since we plan to drop on French victory points, we relocate 12 of the two-width cavalry uh, into Germany onto three different airports. The focus claim on Yugoslavia is about to finish, which, combined with high world tension, reduces the justification time to only 10 days once we are at war with a major nation. We will continue our way down towards war on Greece for a free war goal. Since we are already in a faction with Germany, we can skip another focus later down the line. The eight military factories on transport planes mean that we end up with five produced planes. If you want to min-max, three are already enough to get the job done, but require a little more micromanagement. As soon as the fifth transport plane is manufactured, we delete the production line and solely focus on infantry equipment. When the war starts, all divisions will be fully equipped, although very poorly trained. After deleting the production line, we station three transport planes in Germany, one in Italy and another one off of the coast of Turkey. Not all five will be needed simultaneously, which is why I mentioned that you can get it easily away with fewer. Our divisions, air wings and ships are in position and ready to go. All that's left now is the paratrooper research. As soon as the paratrooper research is finished, we create a two-width template for them. This is what you need the other five army experience from the required 15 from the war with Ethiopia for. But we have more than enough in this case. 
One battalion of paratroopers per division means that we can have 24 of those divisions in total under the current special forces limitation. War with the Allies is just one day ahead of us now, so let's dive into the final preparations. Let's activate the invasion order, split up our fleet into four task forces and assign them to naval invasion support in the North Sea. I'm sorry to all you Navy experts out there, but streamlining this was my main goal here, so I'm sorry for the gore that you're about to witness. The fleets now provide the needed naval supremacy for our invasion orders to get the green light, so we unpause and wait for midnight. It is crucial that you pause the game again at 1am the next day, when the justification on Albania is finished. What follows now is crucial and time sensitive. After declaring war on Albania, we prepare and launch paradrops before switching our focus back to the UK. The AI somehow does not perceive a guarantee that might trigger as a direct threat, keeping divisions overseas and fleets in the port as consequence. That way we create a brief window of opportunity during which we can retain naval supremacy and fire off naval invasion after naval invasion. We achieve this by waiting one in-game hour until the first batch of 10 divisions leaves the port, select them all and unassign them from their order. This immediately frees up the 10 division cap on naval invasions, allowing us to assign another batch of 10 who won't need additional preparation time. Instead, they leave the port with just the next tick. We do this three times until all of our 30 divisions are on their way to the British coast. Let's not forget about our naval invasion into South Africa and assign the division we've left for exactly this purpose. As expected, it is currently under attack by the British, but they won't be able to kill it. You can see here that the battleships barely have the needed range, but it works. After executing the order, we perform what's called Anglo Spike. At this point in time, Britain has not yet called their subjects into the war. But since we are at war with their overlord, we can straight up just declare war on all their puppets. And each time, world tension rises a bit, making the justification on the US obsolete so we can just cancel it. As a consequence, we now no longer have ongoing justifications, while world tension already sits at 100%. The claim on Yugoslavia through the focus tree, combined with our war with a major nation and high world tension means that the justification on Yugo will only take 10 days. Since the start of the war, barely any time has passed, so just let's increase game speed again. The stacked badges of divisions are now leaving the port towards the United Kingdom. This is the signal for France to enter the stage. Well, tension is high enough for them to be able to join the Allies, which is exactly what we want. It's one less nation to justify on. Let's address the title and core idea of the strategy real quick, while our divisions make landfall. The strategy is called Blood for the Blood God because we are making use of a game mechanic that rewards suiciding divisions into the enemy. As you all know, wars in Hoi 4 end whenever there is no major nation remaining on one side. But whether or not we are able to annex or puppet a nation is determined by the following factors. We need to hold at least a tile of the territory, have inflicted damage on their buildings, or have suffered casualties from them to make demands on them during the peace conference. This only works though if the minor nation is a member of the faction that just capitulated. We don't have to worry about minor nations becoming majors through their factory count in this campaign, but we have to make use of the fact that a minor nation is automatically considered a major once they are a leader of a faction. This means we want to have absolute control over who becomes a major nation and over when they will capitulate. As long as we are at war with a major nation, we get cheap and fast war goals as fascist Italy. We can decrease the justification time even further if the target nation is currently doing a land lease to a hostile nation. In that case, we get another time reduction resulting in a 10-day justification, similar to having a claim. You'll see me check different target nations um, during certain segments for specifically that reason, to check for land lease. This is also why we want to overrun Britain quickly, leave them powerless but alive. That way we can keep justifying in rapid succession. Since all nations required to form the Roman Empire are either democratic or non-aligned, they all will join the Allies as soon as we declare on them. But why haven't we forced France into total surrender by now, you may ask. Well, we could and it would make things in Britain easier since our divisions are currently fighting without any supply from back home, 
For that, we would need to either control Gibraltar or France. Thing is, Spain will lend lease France eventually, but only if it hasn't surrendered yet. Spain will start the land lease at a random point in time, but it happens earliest right after the beginning of the war against the Allies and latest when the justification on Turkey is finished. Without having supply in the UK, things are only moving very slowly on the British islands at the moment. That isn't a problem as long as we try to pin enemy divisions and move around them to quickly gain a bit of local supply and block the ports against reinforcements. The run was recorded after midnight, which led to a couple of small mistakes. Just a second ago, I accidentally sent over a transport plane to the UK, for example. This small error doesn't really have consequences, but others that I'll make shortly absolutely do. With the war goal against Hugo in the back, we sent our paratroopers to capitulate Albania. We do this in a two-step process instead of straight up dropping on all victory points, since the capital is sometimes occupied. Afterwards, we set up a drop deep into Yugoslavian territory to make sure that we will suffer ca casualties from them. We activate the order immediately so we can forget about it. Since Yugoslavia is guaranteed by Czechoslovakia and Romania, we can drag both of them into the war for free without any prior justification. Just checking here if Spain is doing an early or late land lease, and after seeing that it's a late one, we instead start the justification on Turkey, which will take 15 days. As usual, Spain is pain and multiplies on the 17th of July at precisely 1500 hours. If we let them start their civil war, we will need to justify on at least one more nation, so we need to declare on Spain before the civil war breaks out, create annex conditions, and end the war with the Allies on the 16th of July at the latest. Obviously, this will create a problem if our goal is to speedrun the Roman Empire. If both the UK and France are defeated, we need a new major involved. But none of the current majors that we aren't at war with is actually required for Imperium Romanum, never mind the additional challenges. Luckily, I've got a solution for that as well. Something that I should have done earlier is tending to the Balkans. We are going to send our bombers to southern Germany and northern Italy to reach both Czechoslovakia and Romania with our air wings on strategic bombing. Here we make use of the third possible requirement for getting annexed conditions on a minor of a faction. You want to do this a bit sooner to give your air wings enough time to guarantee some damage. I was lucky and it all worked out. We need to keep up the speed of the justifications and get rid of France. Shortly before our war goal on Turkey is ready, France will finally get the land lease from Spain. With a five day time save in the back, we immediately prepare our airborne assault against France You'll see me assign 12 paratrooper divisions in total, but that's actually overkill for this situation. We only need that many if Spain land leases early, allowing us to start the assault before France redeploys its garrison divisions. In that case, you want to drop lots and lots of airborne divisions over Paris, since it's often defended. The war with France has been going on long enough in this case, so paratroopers won't face any resistance whatsoever. After France has fallen, we finally have a supply route into Britain. We also get a nice little share of their stockpile, uh, which we use to put additional infantry divisions into the recruitment queue. To maximize the amount of divisions, we pause the game directly after the peace conference ends. If we leave the game running, most of the surplus equipment would be used for garrison demands. We can reduce that effect by giving garrisons uh, a lower supply priority, but even then some equipment gets taken away from the stockpile, and we still need plenty more divisions. Having a supply connection to Britain restores the movement speed of our divisions, amongst other things, allowing us to take Britain quickly. Our main focus is to now secure the island and surround London. Since there's nothing noteworthy going on, let's jump ahead a couple of days. After declaring a war on Turkey, we move on to our next target, Spain. Turkey gets the same treatment as any miner in this run. As with Yugoslavia, a couple of paratroopers have to be sacrificed in order to create guaranteed casualties. There is only enough time left to finish one last justification before the war ends. Our war goal on Spain is ready on the 22nd of June, but I forgot to redeploy transport planes, which is why I delayed the start of the war here until they arrive on the 24th. We can nevertheless just keep uh, justifying. Austria is going to be the last nation that we declare on during this war. Our mission in Britain went pretty successfully. We have taken all relevant ports with the exception of a single one far up north and surrounded London with plenty of divisions. 
After the focus befriend Bulgaria is done, we go ahead and bypass Pact of Steel, but won't start the next focus just yet. The reason for that is a bit muddy and I'm not 100% certain that it's a fact and not just a co coincidence with uh, something else during my test runs, but I'll get back to this question again when the war ends. By now our transport planes should have redeployed to southern France and I don't think I've ever played a campaign in which I was looking that much on redeployment and arrival times. Anyway, we prepare our sacrifice to the blood god and get on with it right away. Or as Mussolini once said, I don't think he and I meant the same thing though. There's nothing of relevance happening until the war goal on Austria is done, so let's skip ahead a bit. We quickly clear London without actually moving into the tile before switching over to the Alps again. I've made another mistake here, it really was getting late at this point. I usually have already deployed the divisions that are in training right now, but I totally forgot about it this time. And I didn't even notice until after I declared the war. Luckily this doesn't really pose a problem, we just spawn the divisions close to the border, give them a general and a frontline order. All they need to do is hold and that shouldn't be an issue against so few divisions. Next up we start the justification on Hungary. It will take 15 days. The Spanish Civil War breaks out in 10, so it's about time that we end this war. There is an additional requirement in place in regards to the annex conditions in faction wars that I haven't told you about. A minor faction member needs to be in the war for at least seven days, otherwise they won't be part of the peace conference and the war with them carries over to after the peace deal. While there is enough time to fulfill that requirement for Austria, we don't actually want to do that, because it would seriously delay our next move. Instead, we drop some paratroopers without the intention of capitulating Austria. We just want to make sure that the war continues. If we don't hold a piece of their territory, the war with Austria might just end. Canada, New Zealand and Australia will not be present for the same reason. Neither us nor them have created any war score against the other party. They shouldn't feel too safe though, we might not require them to be able to form the Roman Empire, but they are an easy grab, so we will at least attempt to annex them in the future. The war goal against Hungary is what will start our second war. That way we do not lose any days in between. The problem of course, as previously mentioned, is to get another major into the war fast, so that we have reduced justification times beyond the bonuses from high world tension. The first step towards that important milestone is to end this war soon, which is why we move our troops into London right after paratroopers landed in Austria. We end the war against the Allies on the 9th of July. The war goal on Hungary finishes on the 21st. So far everything went according to plan, a few mishaps aside. In our first peace conference we spared Ethiopia. In this one we will again spare a nation, but for very different reasons. Leaving Ethiopia independent was necessary to bypass the focused triumph in Africa. This time we will leave Romania unharmed, completely, so no puppeting, no annexing, no nothing, not even a tiny bit. That's because we want Romania to become the new faction leader of the Allies. If you simply annex everything right now, Canada would become the new faction leader. While this wouldn't make things impossible, we absolutely want to avoid it since we aim to repeat what we just finished. Waging war against the Major and keeping them alive while justifying on all other required nations in the meantime. By allowing Romania to stay independent, they will take over faction leadership as the next strongest nation on the list of members. Alternatively, you can do this with Czechoslovakia. I cannot guarantee the same outcome though, since I haven't tested it as much. With the peace conference done, we can move onwards to the final piece of the puzzle, while I recruit additional divisions and reorganize army, navy and air force in the background. It's nice and all that Romania is faction leader now, but they also need to give out a guarantee to Hungary. Declaring on Hungary and waiting for them to join the Romanian-led allies is rather hopeless, since Romania will not join the war for quite a while. I think that's because of the post-war truth period, but it might just well be the dangerous border modifier. Romania will also not guarantee Hungary if we annex Austria before. It's not about Austria really, but about us being at war while justifying. It was quite the pain to find the perfect setup here. That's also why we didn't continue towards the war with Greece focus, 
since I believe it would make Romania not join the next war, or at least not instantly. Long story short, we will start the focus as soon as Romania joins the war on Hungary, just to be safe. As promised, we will spread our influence further across the globe. Not because we have to, but simply because we can. While I'm setting that up in the background, let's give a shout out to all the people that contributed to the strategy, because if you think that I'm smart enough to pull this off on my own, I sadly have to disappoint you here. This strategy is the brainchild of the Hoi Four speedrunning community, and I want to give a special shout out to Survivor Michi, who helped a ton with this run. Amongst other things, he pointed out the possible shortcut to a free war goal on Greece, and a faster justification on Yugo through getting the claim on them in time. Anglo Spike is also something he came up with. In previous runs, I was able to form Roman Empire in December 1936. Michi's advice helped me to push this time to October, which is just phenomenal. Unless you do Yugostrut, another impressive strategy for very early wars that Michi conceived, you would have barely just started your first war as Germany with a manual justification at this point. I've linked his channel down below as well as the Hoi4 leaderboards on speedrun.com. If you enjoy this kind of playstyle, come pay us a visit on Discord and maybe attempt a speedrun yourself, be it RTA or IGT. Now back to the game. The second war of the campaign is about to start, but the part that needs a long explanation is pretty much over. Moving forward, we just need to make sure that the justifications keep on coming, that we fulfill the annex conditions, surround the Romanian capital, cover all hostile borders and make use of reduced justification time from land lease wherever possible. In case you want to watch the one and a half hour long original video for whatever reason, it's linked in the description as well. Next on the menu is Hungary. We leave them a bit of breathing space so they move away from the victory point in the south. That way we can again snipe VPs to capitulate them quickly. Romania joins the war immediately so we can safely go for war with Greece. It will take 60 days to finish, but that's still within our time limit. We already deployed a full army along the border with Portugal and will justify on them right away. 15 days later and we're ready to go. They don't have enough divisions to cover the border, so you can just snake through the lines. Moving on to Iraq, Belgium, which gets land lease, Switzerland, Greece, the Netherlands, which also gets land lease, and Bulgaria. Now all that's left is Luxembourg. They also get land lease, from Switzerland in this case. Finding ways to reliably have all three Benelux nations get reduced justification time was a real headache, especially for Luxembourg. Making this work requires a long checklist, starting with taking out South Africa in the first war and ending with justifying on Switzerland before we go after the Benelux states. It is very tempting to go after them in the first war already, since they all get land lease during that time as well, but we absolutely need Luxembourg as the last optimization in this IGT speedrun. But first, we need to end the current war. For that to happen, Romania has to capitulate, which we plan for by taking all victory points and encircled Bucharest already. It's at this point in time that I get the first little heart attack, thinking that I might have to restart all over again. I already cleared the last defending divisions in the Romanian capital, but waited a bit too long to send my divisions into the city tile. If we want to realize our campaign goal on the earliest possible date, we have to end the war before the 20th of October, the day that we get the last war goal on Luxembourg. But all divisions will apparently take multiple days to move into that tile. That's way too long. So I think about alternatives and think and think. It's 2 a.m. by now and I was really looking forward to finally getting it done. Luckily, we have paratroopers in range of Bucharest, which will finish the job in time. And that's the end of the second war. This time, there are no shenanigans involved. We just straight up annex everything. In the meantime, let me explain why it's so important that Luxembourg comes last. It's the only nation relevant to the formation of the Roman Empire that consists of just a single tile. That means we can take over all of the territory of a nation before the end of the first day of conflict, and thereby unlock the decision towards Imperium Romanum. 
In any other case, we would have to wait until at least midnight for when the game checks whether or not a nation has fallen below the surrender limit. As you can see, we can annex most of the former dominions as well as the Dutch East Indies thanks to our tiny naval invasions. Canada didn't join the Second War, unfortunately, despite being a member of the Allies, so the planned naval invasion against them never fired. It's now the 20th of October, and we own all of the required territory for the formation of the Roman Empire. Well, all except Luxembourg, which we have a war goal on. I'm really, really, really looking forward to going to bed at that point, already dreading how tired I'd be in the morning when my kids wake up. So let's just declare on Luxembourg and get it over with. There's nothing that could go wrong now anymore. Well, wrong. I have to again come to the realization that none of the divisions will be able to enter the tile fast enough. So, paratroopers to the rescue one more time. Well, they are in range, but the transport planes aren't. Well, damn. Panic is setting in. Is this a reset? On the last goddamn day of the run. I'm testing the arrival times of all divisions, infantry and tanks. Nothing works. With a bit of delay, my brain finally reacts and provides a solution. I just need to change a division into cavalry. Maybe that will work. And it does. The division makes it onto the tile just barely before midnight. But it is still the 20th and we now hold everything that we need. <sighs> this means there is only one more thing left to do. Let's open up the decision tab, scroll to the very bottom and finally enact the decision to realize Roman ambitions. Et voila! We have successfully brought back the Roman Empire, and we did so in record time. I've submitted the run to the leaderboards of speedrun.com, and it has been officially verified as the IGT world record in forming the Roman Empire in Hearts of Iron 4. If you plan to play a campaign beyond this point, I highly recommend uh, you do a couple of things differently. First of all, take better care of your navy. Secondly, do not fully annex uh, the UK and France, puppet them instead, but only leave them territory that isn't required for the decision. After that, you can annex both nations through the autonomy system to gain control over their fleets. Getting Canada into the peace deal is something you should definitely aim for and either justify directly on them or wait until they join the second war. That way you have a direct border with the United States and it's pretty easy to capitulate them if you come down from Canada. The Soviets are a bit harder to crack without cheesing it and require an upgrade to your templates, but don't pose a real challenge either. Well, no nation is actually a challenge anymore for Augustus Mussolini and the Roman Empire. It's the first time that I've put this much effort into a single video, so I really hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below. And if you have questions about the campaign, please go ahead and ask. Till next time.